Major funding for The Great American Quilt is provided by Fairfield Processing Corporation, maker of Polyfill brand products for crafting. By RJR Fashion Fabrics, where innovation is a tradition. By New Home, changing the way America sews. By Keepsake Quilting, publishers of the Keepsake Quilting Catalog, the Quilter's Wish Book. By American School of Needlework Incorporated, publisher of books in all areas of needlework. And by Lehman Publishing, publisher of Quilter's Newsletter Magazine, the magazine for quilt lovers. Thanks for taking time to be with us today. We've got a good show for you beginners as well as you more experienced people because our theme today is simplicity. We'll be talking not only about quilts just made with squares right together, but about nine patch quilts. Diane and Laura are going to show you their very quick method of putting together a nine patch block. And then we'll see how Amish women have used the nine patch in some really wonderful quilts. We'll be looking at quilts from the Esprit Corporation collection. Then, since my theme and idea for the show is simplicity, I wanted to just look at one artist's work toward the end of the show. Her name is Rebecca Shore, and I think she does some very pure and very strong work that kind of pushes the square a little bit forward. I got the idea for concentrating just on squares when I got a Christmas card from a friend of mine. He had a little quilt block in the Christmas card. When I opened it up, this little block fell out, and it just seemed so really pure and kind of delicate that I thought, why haven't we been concentrating a little bit more on some of the simpler designs? You know, quilts can be very, very plain um, as well as very ornate. And often when I go to quilt shows lately, I seem to notice the very ornate, very decorative quilts. It's kind of a trend that's going on lately, and that's great. But I'm going to step back just a little bit and look at some of the simpler quilts today, because they can be very, very beautiful. And I want you to understand that you can make quilts however you want. It's OK to make them in squares. In fact, making simple squares like this and putting them together is probably the way that most of you got started. If you're anything like me, I found myself one night just putting squares together without even knowing what I was doing, not knowing um, what way to do it. My quilt kind of looked like that, too, by the time I was done. But um, the kids have liked it, and the cat right now is actually out in the garage, sick, sleeping on this little quilt. So go from the basics and find something that works well for you. Put it together block by block, or you can put little squares together to make a real patchwork block. Along with putting squares together a whole row at a time, you can also organize them so that the squares are sewn together into blocks, which is kind of a more portable patchwork. This quilt is called a 16 patch quilt because it contains squares that are made up of 16 smaller squares, really four rows of four. Blocks like this four patch were traditionally beginner's quilt blocks. They were the first patchwork that little girls like my great-grandmother learned to sew. I like to think that the reason she looks so pensive is that she is thinking of all that sewing she has to do. Because girls this young and even younger were expected to help their mothers with the family sewing. And they also had to begin sewing quilt tops, sheets, towels, and so on to save until they themselves were married. It was a source of pride to have sewn a bed-sized quilt top by the age of five or six. On my fifth birthday, I had finished all but three patches for a quilt, and Papa was so anxious that I should get it all done on that day that he said he would make one for me if I would make two. Mother always bought needles and thread and dry goods and put them to good use making clothes for the family and teaching my sister and me to sew. Before I was five years old, I had pieced one side of a quilt sitting on her knee half an hour a day, and you can be sure she insisted on tiny stitches. One woman recalled many years after the event how she lost the quilt block she'd been making 
when she was a girl. Mother would give me tiny scraps to put in my quilt blocks that Grandmother Smith was showing me how to make. I was making a nine-patch block, and sometimes I had to piece the pieces in order to get a little block, one inch square. One day, we had been playing down by the shed where we kept old Lena, the cow. I forgot to take my basket in the house with me, and when I went to get it, it was gone. Mother said she was afraid Lena had eaten it. I think that was the greatest loss I ever had in my life, and to this day, I remember how badly I felt. Today we sew for the fun of it, but we must remember that less than 100 years ago, sewing was often a duty rather than an entertainment. Every young girl should be taught to do the following kinds of stitch with propriety. Overstitch, hemming, running, felling, stitching, backstitch and run, button stitch, chain stitch, whipping, darning, gathering, and cross stitch. Now we've got sewing machines so we can let them do the work and concentrate on the fun parts, which is color and design. Since we've been talking about simplicity, I wanted to look with you at some of the most simple and beautiful quilts that I know, quilts by the Amish. And the best place I know to find quilts that are hanging all together is in the Esprit Corporation collection. And this is their big book. I know their curator, Julie Silburn, so I asked Julie to send me some slides so we could look at some quilts that are nine patch quilts. But you see in this great big book, and if any of you have this one or borrow it from the library, it's definitely not a book that you would want to read in bed because it would crush your nose, I think, if you fall asleep while you're reading like I do. But look at the beautiful, simple designs that they do with squares. They really excel in using proportion and using very subdued color in a very beautiful way. Esprit, of course, is the clothing firm, so you would really expect them to be sensitive about fabric since they're using it every day and making their clothes. And they really are. You notice it when you walk into the building. Their building is a, a reconstructed winery, and it's beautiful kind of tones of wood all over, and they've got plants and rugs on the floor. But I've got to admit, it's the quilts that really take your breath away when you enter the building. And you can find them all over there in offices and outside in hallways. They, for those of you who know about taking care of quilts, Julie does uh, change them from time to time. So if you're ever in San Francisco, even if you've seen the collection before, because you can go and tour it, you'll often see different quilts on different walls because they are changed a lot. Isn't this a wonderful one? When a spree decides they're going to give their quilts away, this is the one that I want. Now that you've seen how beautiful a nine patch, something as simple as that can be, Laura and Diane are going to show you, believe it or not, how simple it is to make, and it all begins just with strips. Oh, great, Diane. I see you've got all those fabrics cut and ready for us to go. Today, Diane and I are going to show you just how easy it is to make a nine patch block. Take a look here at the two nine-patch blocks, which are used in the border of Sharon Williams' scrap sampler quilt. These are six-inch nine-patch blocks, and you can see that two fabrics were used for making them, a light and a dark. And that's part of the beauty in making the nine-patch block is that you only need to worry about two fabrics, a light and a dark. Today, we're going to show you step-by-step -step instructions for making the nine-patch blocks. We'll begin with using your fabrics and cutting them into strips. And then we're going to take the strips and we're going to construct them into this nine patch block. And finally, we have several quilts to share with you which use the nine patch block in various arrangements and settings and color schemes. And that's gonna be really exciting. Okay, I want to review with you quickly the quick cutting techniques for cutting strips from your fabrics. I'm using here an extra piece of fabric that I'm going to be cutting on the cross grain. I love so much to use these cutting tools that are available to us today. And I will be cutting two and a half inch wide strips. Now, if you don't have some of these cutting tools, that's perfectly fine. You can just as easily do this step with a pair of scissors. Now, you can see I've cut a two and a half inch wide strip. What you will need to do is cut three two and a half inch wide strips from each of your two fabrics. 
just as I've done here. I'm going to take these strips now and go to the sewing machine and put them together in the stripping, piece stripping technique. I put my right sides together and I put them under my presser foot, stitching a quarter of an inch. Now make sure that you don't tug or pull on these strips. Just let them work evenly underneath your sewing machine. Just let the sewing machine do the work for you. The nine patch block is a great beginning block. Beginners can make it just like I made it. When I was a little girl, I made a quilt for my dolly. Now we have the first seam. I like to take and finger press. Now I'm going to press this to the dark side. Take and just run your fingers down through. Just give this a quick finger press, then add your other strip. And then I will just stitch all the way down here to make this unit. This is the light unit and this is the dark unit. Notice that I have pressed using an iron to make these very flat. Next, take your strips and cut them apart every two and a half inches. Just like that. Now I want you to continue down the full length of the set of strips cutting every two and a half inches so that you will end up with pieces that look like this. Can you see how this one has come off from this set here? And this one would have come off from this one. Now I'm ready to arrange these. And I'm going to sew them together. So let me pick them up and show you how to join the seams. If you will, bend back one quarter of an inch Take your pin, put it into your seam allowance, and stay a quarter from the edge so that I can sew this quarter of an inch seam and not uh, sew over the pins. Pinning the seams down, you can see one seam goes in one direction, the other seam goes in the other direction. Now, I, just let me quickly put this through the sewing machine here and show you how this seams up. There, now we've got it. Take the pins out, do a little finger pressing here. And now, you can see how well those seams are joined together. And we will add this other side. Press, sew, press, and then we have a finished nine patch. You can see the nine patch block here and how well the seams are joined together with the seams going in opposite direction from the back side. We have several nine patch quilts that we have uh, borrowed from quilting friends of ours that we'd like to share with you some of the variations and possibilities of making a nine patch quilt. Take a look at this one, oh, Diana. This is a wonderful <laughs> quilt. This a beauty? And this is such a large one. My goodness, well, Bernice, she always makes large quilts, <laughs> bed size quilts. Bed size it is. Notice how she's used, these are three inch blocks that Bernice has just <sighs> joined together and it looks as though she's just pulled them all out of her scrap basket to make She this. has, she's got warm and cool colors working together and she's got dark and light colors working together. This is such a beautiful, beautiful quilt. It almost looks like it's just a little woven basket, doesn't it? Yes, yeah, just like a woven piece of tapestry. Also, notice that the quilting, diagonal quilting line down through the patchwork. This is especially important on the nine patch because then you're not quilting into the seams. That's right. Here's one too. This this oh, is a fun this one, Diane. <laughs> love this, this one. This one was a group effort. This was made by my quilting group for Rosalie Sanders. And what we did was each, each one of us, there were 12 of us, that got together one evening and we each brought 15 of these 3 inch 9 patch blocks and then we also brought 15 of these squares which we call the alternate blocks. And uh, 
we sat for about two hours and joined all of these pieces together. Two through, hours? Two hours, that's all. Oh, Lord, this and, is great. Uh, and we made the quilt top. And I say quilt top because at this point that is exactly what it is. You can see on the back that uh, all of the seams are, are visible here. But eventually, Rosalie will put it together and make it. The thing I like, though, about this one happens to be the her background fabric. Her choice of fabrics, yes, isn't that great? Yes, this large rose print and then the smaller dark rose print. Very often we don't use these large prints as a background fabric. But well, I think sometimes they're frightened off by them, but uh, it works so well here. Oh, it does. Another thing that's so nice about using this block for groups is that you have so many levels of quilt makers, and this one is easy enough for the beginner, but I think because of the different variations, it's challenging enough for even the experience. I still can't believe that 15 women <laughs> put together this quilt <laughs> in two hours. Well, 15 women can do a lot of things. That's right. Look at this one here. This was made by Gay Perry. Now this set is on point, as you can see. It forms a, a diamond. Oh, Gay is such a good colorist. She knows exactly where to put the lights and where to put the darks and what color next to another color. Mm -hmm. However, also her choice of border. Look right. at this. Oh, well, I think she chose all of the fabrics in the center. From her border? Mm -hmm. From her border fabric. Beautiful, beautiful. I like the way, notice how she's used these uh, plain blocks, which we call alternate blocks, and it's just such an easy way of enlarging the quilt. See, she really doesn't have too many nine patches no, in this she quilt. Doesn't. But it sure gives the feeling of it, and uh, it enlarges it quite a bit. Oh, I love this light center. And this, her background fabric, oh, that's a beautiful tone-on-tone -tone print. And then she, how she's repeated it mm -hmm. out then into, into the, border. the border also. Laura, look Wonder at the binding. Wonderful little <laughs> stripe binding. binding. As you can see, there are just an endless possibilities with this block, and we just hope that you'll have fun with it. Oh, the nine patch should really turn you on. It's a great block. You're going to love this possibility. I'll show you in just a second, because I want you to get the overall idea that some of you are small print people, some of you are big tropical print people, like Vivian Ritter. This is from Evergreen, Colorado. She made this for her daughter, and this is the part, this is like making beds get down there. It is huge. It's 168 blocks. This is the part that I wanted you to take a look at. She's done a nine-patch label. This is her daughter, Kelly, and probably embarrassingly enough to Kelly, it also comes with her baby picture for posterity. It will always have this on there. Vivian made this for her daughter's graduation. And we'll be showing you a lot more labels by Vivian later. She wrote a book on labels. Let's see if I can get this monster back in here. This is only half the quilt. Kelly must have a bed that never ends, because this is a big fellow. Here is one that is completely different. The idea behind this one is the nine patch as a picture. So a nine patch doesn't always just have to be a design. This is kind of an abstracted picture of a flower garden. This is by Suzanne Chelland. Suzanne is from Gig Harbor, Washington, and she is a hand dyer. So she dyed all the fabric for this quilt. And then she has done some quilting, what's called quilting in the ditch, which is done with a machine or by hand, but it's just in those little spaces. We'll be showing you in a later program how you can do these graduated colors with dyeing. And this I love. This is a gorgeous quilt also. Another big fellow. I'll try to get that out for you so you can see it. Again, the idea behind this is a picture. As you can see, here are the nine patch blocks coming right up here. Think of these as flowers, like hollyhocks or delphiniums, one of those big, tall, gorgeous flowers. And what she's done to make these is make nine patch blocks like this that are um, little pieces cut out of. Believe it or not, this is a traditional block that Kathleen McCready, she's from Austin, Texas, she made this quilt. She found this in an old quilt block. And notice right next to it here is a log cabin block, and that's the subject of next week's program. I've got a beautiful quilt back here before I open this one up for, for you. This is Carol Gerson. And people are really starting to do nice things with the back of their quilt. And when I open it up, 
you can see that it's a very simple design. That's the idea I'm trying to get across to you as, is that you can do very simple. You don't have to put every color in the rainbow. You can do some simple designs with these great squares. She's put little tiny four block, four patch blocks in here. And it just makes a very elegant, kind of a quiet quilt. So you can be quiet too. You can be tropical or you can be whatever you want your quilt to be. Now I was intrigued by this little four patch because it reminded me of this antique quilt that I had. This is a four patch in this quilt. I bought this maybe 15 years ago for just about $20. And it's a very typical quilt. Take a look at this kind of hot pink fabric because I'm willing to bet if you've got a quilt of this era, you probably have some of this fabric in it. And it's interesting to me that it looks really contemporary because it's hot pink. It surprises people. And it's such a popular fabric that it's still been used today. This is Diane and Laura's block, one of their nine patches. And I wanted Rod to take a look at this quilt and tell us a little bit more about this really popular hot pink fabric. I wanted to show you this quilt. I think I got it at a farm auction, oh, about 15 years ago. That's about the time I bought my first quilt at a farm auction. I'm glad you weren't there bidding against me. I would have. I'm a fierce bidder, Penny. <laughs> this is this double pink fabric you were telling me about. Yeah. The double pinks are a really interesting fabric. And when I started researching for my book, I thought that I could find real distinct changes in the double pinks and, and, and document that and show that. From time period to time period. Yes, yeah. because I knew that, I mean, just having seen so many quilts and having seen the, the color show up throughout quilts in, from the early to late. Well, when you say early, what kind of, when <clears throat> do you start seeing them? 1820s, 30s. Oh, early. Yeah, yeah, 1840s, little bits of it. Um, I started going through fabric sample books, dyers books, and swatch books from the, the printing. In museums? Um, museums. The American Museum of Textile History mm -hmm. is, is one that has a great collection. I learned too, it's unfortunate, a lot of those swatch books were lost by either fires in mills or they were thrown out mm -hmm. because they weren't deemed Considered valuable. Important, yeah. yes. And they're just, they're a wonderful research tool now. But I just started finding that the printers just printed this over and over and did variation upon variation pretty consistently because quilt makers loved it. And, and women were using it for um, clothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've seen children's clothing mm -hmm. made out of double pinks. Mm -hmm. now, now, double pink <coughs> would be, define double pink for me. Well, it's just, it's basically, a pink background with printed over generally with um, you know a deeper red. So it's and no particular pattern it's that no, I mean, double printing with red on pink. Right in, in some of the early writings women referred to it as, as like a seaweed or a sea moss mm -hmm. and, and it does look like that but there were just so many variations because women loved it and the printers just kept printing it and printing it and even within a long period of time, there would be so many variations. Now, the one thing that I've found that quilts of this period, and I look at other fabrics like this one. This okay, is, when do you think this is from about? Okay, I think it's around 1890 uh -huh. to as late as 1910. Uh -huh. And you see double pinks a lot in that 1880 to 1910 period. In, used a lot, used as the sashing, or even the whole quilt may be the pattern using a double pink fabric against white. Mm -hmm. Earlier quilts, you'll see little bits, small pieces of double pinks. You have to look at the other fabrics and you have to look at the pattern mm -hmm. to, to, to date it, um, just as you do with this. It, this I mentioned Rebecca Shore's work earlier in the program. Rebecca, who I said before was from Chicago, takes a square and just pushes it a little bit further. And I think she does some work that is both traditional looking and forward looking at the same time. 
This is one of Becky's early quilts from 1983, and I find I never get tired of looking at it. I really love the playful way she's cut some of the plaids on the bias. So your eye senses movement in part of the quilt, and other parts seem to lie completely flat. While the center, at least for me, has kind of a 3D look, it, it almost looks as though you can see through a grid out to a sky full of shooting stars. Becky's latest work plays with 3D cubes, some of which seem to be sunlit because their brightness is seen against muted menswear colors and patterns. Because Rebecca is from Chicago, I wanted to use the phrase that a well-known architect made famous because when I think of Chicago, I think of its wonderful architecture. And that architect is Mies van der Rohe, and his phrase was, less is more. And what less is more means to me is that something that's very uncomplicated and simple can often be just as beautiful or more beautiful than something that's very complicated. So if you're a very simple quilt type of person, just go with it. That's great. Next week, we'll see Terry Mangott's guardian angel, who will be here with us, and we'll see what it was like to be dragged halfway across the country to live in a log cabin. <laughs>